Um, I'm alongside Steve Howson, as you know, and uh, we are talking five favourite cricketers, five influential cricketers. We've already spoken to Darren Goff and uh, Alex Tudor in this new series. Uh, I mean, the first thing I want to ask you is um, about the lack of a childhood hero. Goffey and uh, Tudor both saying, well, as a young lad growing up, I looked up to him or him and wanted to be him. But that wasn't a feature in your early years, was it? No, it, it wasn't. It was mine. I, I want to be a football lad. No interest in in cricket, really. I wasn't. I wasn't somebody that that enjoyed playing cricket for long periods of time. It was three months in the summer when you know, I always finished the football season, always started the football season, and you know probably the biggest influence in in my life and in my career was was Jeff Cook, the the the, the, the biggest one, the, the the number one in. Uh, I think for a, for a lot of players that came through that Durham you know, conveyor belt of, of cricketers that either went on to play for England or had van, fantastic first class careers. Okay, so this is number one, Jeff. So, Cook. so, it, but it was to to sort of make the case in point when Jeff first saw me. I think he was watching Michael Goff, the umpire, who was playing for for Durham youth um, youth team. I think under 16s, I think it was, in a game at Jesmond. I was playing for Northumberland and. I think Jeff apparently had gone round to the Northumberland coaches and said, where on earth are you getting him from? And I think the Northumberland coaches said, well, you know, you better not blink because you might miss him. And he's like, Where's, what's his story? And he just said, we might get him, we might not get him. He sometimes comes and plays and sometimes doesn't. It depends if there's a football match on. And that was, you know, that was the way the coaches had it at Northumberland with me. I was, I was always football orientated. Um, and then when Jeff seen me for the first time, you know, that was, I think that was in August of 1996. And um, within, a, within a month, I'd played two, first, uh, two second team games, Middlesex, come across Ian Gould, the, the, uh, the great umpire gunner. But he was second team coach for Middlesex. I put him on his backside at number 11. He keeps reminding me as a, as a wayward 17 year old and then played against, I think it was Worcester, second team. And then I was thrust into a first team, first class debut at, at 17 years old on the, uh, in the, against Leicestershire, who won the championship that day. You know that week they the beat us in two days, and my baptism into into cricket was you know playing for Northumberland under 17s, and Jeff Cook was the one that that really sort of made it you know, made you know made it clear that he wanted me to play cricket for for Durham and uh, he, he went out of his way to make sure that I was doing everything I could to, to try and sort of further myself on so he was the first person that saw me and for the next 20 years I, I would say he was probably the biggest influence in my career driving me forward. He played a long time for North Ants. He played seven test matches for England as well, but he is known and uh, will probably always be remembered as the, the kind of founding father of, of Durham first-class cricket, isn't he? I mean, he did a great job with the PCA as well. He improved the, the lives and, and professional livelihoods of, of so many professional cricketers. But when he, he went to Durham, I mean, he, he, he is credited with, you know, almost kind of being single-handedly steering the, the the Durham first class journey is that a fair reflection it's a fair reflection he was for me he's the closest thing in cricket that there is to Sir Alex Ferguson you know if the one thing about Sir Alex you heard about the stories of him caring about you know knew the family's names and you knew everything about families and and Jeff was like that Jeff took over you know Durham at 1991 as, as as captain in the minor counties and then oversaw everything for the next 20 30 years and everybody that came through came through sort of you know Jeff's, Jeff's tutorage and the, we got you know I, I managed to go on and play I, I had a year out in 1997 when we came back from Pakistan and we had disillusioned with the game and there was you know a few senior players in there that were big influences John Morris another one who was a massive influence on my career Simon Brown who you aspired to because Simon Brown played cricket for England he had played he had played one test for England and John Lewis who was captain of Durham for a large proportion of my time um, were, were great senior players to look up to along with John Wood but Jeff was was always somebody that was there he brought through all the academy lads you, you remember him the first time I've meant I've told the story many times about Ben Stokes when he he, got, he came up he was he was so excited in the army I've got one 
I said, oh, I said, hey, is he close? He went, yeah, he's not not too far away. I said, how old is he? He went 14. So we can't be that far. He can't, can't be that close. And he played as a 16-year-old. So Jeff knew, I mean, the ins and outs. He would go to the, the mining villages, the mining, town, the mining towns to, to unearth the Paul Collingwoods, the Neil Colleens, the players that came through, Liam Plunkett's, you know, Jeff, Graham Onions, Phil, Phil Mustard, all these players that came through. They all came through from Jeff, but there was a turning point for me in Durham's history when, when, when it got to about I think 2004, 2000, yeah, it was 2004 time when Martin Moxon left, and I remember having a conversation with Jeff Cook, Paul Collingwood in a room, and saying, "You can't take over as coach," and it was a little bit of a heated discussion with Jeff, and. And it was like, we've got such a conveyor belt of fantastic young players coming through, and that's all from you. That can't stop. And um, Jeff was like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to take over the coach. And um, I think it was 2005, I think that was how it was. And then all of a sudden, the John Winders came up underneath him, learned a lot bringing these kids through, and that conveyor belt didn't stop. And Jeff went on to, to take Durham into a, a whole new level from his coaching point of view. And we, we won the championship twice, we won the Friends Provident, and then we won the championship again in 2013. He was an amazing man, an amazing man to be around as well, to talk cricket to. He was a nightmare sometimes. He was, the, he was always the, one of the last ones in the bar, and he would buy you the last pint, and then he would tell you, you know, you know a few stories, along with you know, Norman Gifford as well was another influence from a career, from a coaching point of view, first up. You know, two great men, and, and then Jeff would, would see you at court to 11 the next morning and just remind you about what the plans were for the day and what a lovely evening we had the night before, and... You know, did we have one too many? He would look at you steely in the eye. Did we have one too many last night? And I was like, no, why? He's like, a bit of a thick head this morning. I was like, and you're sitting there and you're cursing him going, he knows I had one too many last night, so I better perform because if I come off at lunchtime and got naught for 40 or naught for 50 of about five overs, he's going to have a go at me because I had one too many last night. But he was just a, I mean, just a great, great person. And that was it. He knew everybody's name. He knew everybody's family's name. He made you feel comfortable and he cared about you. And I think some of, he, he had a heart attack later on in life. And I, and I think that was largely down to the fact that some of the players he was having to let go around about that time were kids that he had had from 11 year old all the way through to 25 and 26 and 28 and 30. And to tell them that their careers were over at the club, I think Jeff takes that, he took that personally. And I think that affected his health a little bit. So I see him uh, every now and again. He's still, he's still a, a huge factor in my life. I think he can hear that by the way I speak. And I've got five influencers here. And if I've got half an hour to speak, I'd speak 29 minutes about Jeff Cook because for me, he is the man that helped me you know, mold the person that I became as a cricketer. Okay, well, I'm going to lighten the mood now. Move you on to Darren Goff. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Goffy. Goffy was, if there was one childhood hero coming, it was Goff. 20, you know, 94, 95 Ashes tour when he... He, 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 he came with a whirlwind, didn't he? He was, he was just this, this great... He had the next team both and what it was going to be. He took Australia on, he popped his chest out. Um, and he was just... He was just he was brilliant. He was, the, he was the one that, you know, all the, the teenagers wanted to be when, when I was, you know, that, that's 15, 16 years old. You know, when you did watch the cricket, it was the larger than life character. He wasn't like the, the 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 normal MCC old school tie brigade. He was, he was the Barnsley rough diamond that was was just beautiful when it came to to the fast bowl and he had a huge amount of character and he was um, he, he was the one if there was anyone growing up that I wanted to be. And you know, some people say you you, you don't want to meet your heroes. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had two heroes growing up in life in sport. One was Darren Goff and one was Alan Shearer. And both of them become good friends of mine. And when they say don't meet your heroes, that's nonsense because mine were even better than what I, that I thought they were in, in Goff. The first time I played against Goff, he bowled a ball and he, you know, I, I managed to get something on it. And he got down on one knee with a camera, a pretend camera. And he was like, I bet your mum and dad are taking your picture right now, me bowling at you. And I was like, who on earth is this? <laughs> but just, a, just a, I mean, as, a, as a, an infectious person when you're on the field and to be in a dressing room with Darren Goff, um, your, your day gets brightened. I can't wait to move on to... David Boone, uh, because that's going to be that. I know that I've heard some of the stories uh, so many times from you, and I want to hear them all again. But um, 
there are two great West Indian bowlers who obviously, um, well, for obvious reasons, I suppose, feature on your list. Um, Courtly Bros. Yeah, yeah, Courtney Bros. Yeah. Well, that first time I came, no, when I first came into the game, I was described as like a, a white West Indian. That's what the the headline was. Is this you know there's like you know a bowler who looks a bit like Ambrose and Walsh and you know the the more West Indian type of bowler, tall, tall hits the deck from a you know good pace from a a decent height. And you know, I, I think it was. I think it was Justin Langer, and you come on to David Boone. I had a massive argument and a little. We nearly got into a little fight on the field in, in one of my early. I think it's my third first-class match in at, at Lords against Justin Langer, and you know David Boone's captain, 1998. I think it was. I'm bowling at Langer, and I've hit him a few times, and. He, he described me as a, you know, something like uh, Ambrose and Walsh, and you know, it was a nice compliment from 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 Langer, who I was going to have so many battles with in years to come. But at, at, at the time, you know, he he got into my face, trying to I thought it was like intimidating one of the youngsters, and I didn't think he realised he was coming up against somebody who would fight back, and and I've gone obviously just as as hard back at him, and I remember David Boone getting in between the two of us as I was having a go at this you know I, and it was a little bit my youth of naivety and this year's this international batter and i'm on my third first class match and i you know i was <laughs> my radar wasn't the best at the best of times even when i was playing international cricket it was one down leg side one down the offside and there was one hitting you know justin langer in the ribs and he's having a go at me i'm having a go at him and you know it was a, it was a nice little nice little duel but that was the first time somebody had said about you know, the, the, the similarities to a West Indian type bowler and the, the two bowlers that were, you know, the, yeah, described as was Walsh and Ambrose. Ambrose had just finished, Walsh was still playing. And actually the week after I went and played against Gloucestershire at Durham and got my first first class five for against Courtney and Courtney was playing and I, I remember he, he had two jumpers on, freezing cold, mere bowl mere bouncer and I thought, oh, I can hit this, and I hit it, and it went for four, and the next ball, he bowled me another bouncer, and I didn't even get my hands above my waist, and it just bounced straight off the Durham badge, off my helmet. And I was like, ding, my head just was shaking like you'd not believe, and realised that, you know, don't take on the great man, and I didn't after that. So uh, they, were, they were another influ big influences in, in your, in your in, you know, informative years growing up, because, you know, one had 400 wickets, one had 500 test wickets, and they were... They were the ones that you've seen on the TV who were you know, a shining light along with like Glenn McGrath. But Walsh and Ambrose was somebody I looked up to because uh, people were telling me I, I, I bowled quite similar to. The other thing about them is their durability and their loyalty. I mean, Courtney played almost 1,500 games, Test matches, ODIs, First Class and List A games, almost 1,500 games, and um, Kirtley, 1,000. It's two and a half thousand games of, of cricket between them, and they only ever played for one county each, obviously. Um, Gloucestershire for, for Courtney Welsh and Northants for, for Kirtley Ambrose. But it's the, the durability. I mean, as a, as a fast bowler who um, w went through a lot of work yourself, it, did it amaze you that Courtney was still playing Test cricket at 38? Yeah, it was amazing, but it just shows you the, the hunger, the drive that these, ha these guys have to be the best. You know, Glenn McGraw, uh, uh, another one that, you know, talking to the likes of Simon Brown in the dressing room who had played for Jeff Cook and played with Kirtley Ambrose for Northampton, um, listening to David Boone tell stories and, and talk to me about, and we'll come on to Booney and what he taught me about, you know, Courtney Walsh and saying, you know, the reason why they played all year round is because their bodies needed to bowl a lot of overs to keep them in the groove. And the reason why they're playing into their late 30s is because they didn't stop, so they didn't get injured. And then once you start getting injuries, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of my a lot of my time early in my career up until about 30, where I bowled a hell of a lot of overs because I didn't get injured. And then I think I went like something like five, six years without getting an injury. And then I couldn't go five months without an injury after that. And that was just, and I think that's what Kirtley and, and Courtney and, and one or two, Jimmy Anderson, Stuart Broad, taking the white ball off them, prolonged their careers because they just bowl red ball and they bowl over after over after over. And I think some of our... Some of the bowlers around the world now, especially the fast bowlers, the reason why they haven't got the numbers that 
you know the guys from years gone by have got because they don't bowl enough you know in practice why and even even now but why, get asked the question as a former fast bowler why are people getting injured i don't think they bowl enough and I've, now one thing that cannot be labeled at ambrose and walsh is they needed to bowl to prolong their career and they did bowl courtney walsh played 18 years and his longest break he reckons with two weeks <laughs> no, uh, seriously, and I it, mean, it, you it, might be exaggerating, it, but it's that's right. And, you know, if I had if I had two weeks off, it took me two week it took me two weeks to stand up to get my action up straight to get the ball down where I wanted to build the confidence that I was in already in a position to go. And you know, I, I had to talk a lot about preparation and had a few a few disagreements about preparation before this Indian tour. But it would it, 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 preparation is not one size fits all. It would take Simon a week to get prepared it would take Hoggy maybe 10 days to get prepared for a tour it would take me a minimum three weeks because of my long limbs and the way my action was you know these you know, Ambrose and Walsh were two guys who just constantly needed to bowl okay we need I'm so conscious we're running out of time um, and uh, we we can talk for an hour as you know uh, so on to David Boone then Jeff Cook was the early Durham years David Boone was the, well towards the end of his career, but a massive, massive influence on Durham as well. He was a huge influence on Durham, and if Booney tells a story that in that year where I, I, I had me injury, that I was obviously nervous about you know, being around you know characters like David Boone and Jeff had told him who and what you know, what he had got, what 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 he had found, and I think the first time Boone David Boone was told to watch. Was he, he was told to watch from the stand. Don't come down because he'll 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 feel you know, you know insecure where, when you're there. And Booney said after watching for five minutes, he got put his pads on and walked out. And Booney came out and faced in the nets. And I was, then I was. I mean, I was. I can't really say what I was what I was, but I was I was very nervous, should we say? And it, uh, from there, I, I built up a great bond with with Booney. He taught me how to bowl long spells. Because there was times after like eight and nine and ten overs, I'm still bowling and I'm looking at my captain and thinking, because he always wore the glasses and you know, is Booney awake over there? At slip and I'm you know taking my jumper and off the umpire and walking out to fine leg as I'm looking around going, I must uh, Booney, am I still bowling? He just he just nod at me, you know, no high fives with David Boone. There was no handshakes. If you got a slap on the side of the leg or a slap on the backside, if you when you took a wicket, you knew you were going well. He was just a he was just a great man, and he he's very simple. He taught me that the, the humble side of you know being around you are just just being around as a as a human being, the human element. You had time for everybody, speak with with everybody, have a beer in the bar, and I know you know the the 52 cans was a, was a, is always a, a great topic of conversation. Um, but for me, it didn't matter who, who was in the conversation; he was the same. He was just a, a really really nice man. Um, but when it come to come to like playing the game, I never really seen only seen him lose his temper once or twice. And there was one game against South Africa I'll never forget and show the character of David Boone. We we played South Africa between the first and second test. South Africa had just lost, I think, in the first test. And Boone, and, you know, they had 90 here with Alan Donald, um, Sean Pollock, Lance Klusner, I think Brian McMillan played. And they had they had fast bowlers. And Durham was struggling 80-odd for... Eight, we had lost a few wickets. And Alan Donald bowled around the wicket at David Boone. He hit him in the grill second third ball bust the grill and we're going that's it you know anybody else would have just either walked off chip one up in the air and Booney retired 38 year old 37 year old got 80 88 89 so determined that he wasn't going to get beat he was still in the international contest and that's what Durham meant to him and he'd give that off that's just one little example because of he felt Durham was like Tasmania when Tasmania first came into the Sheffield Shield he helped build that up into a force, and he did that at Durham. And in, even to this day, you know, David Boone, there's a resemblance of David Boone in everywhere you look at Durham County Cricket Club because it started. I think it started from him. Durham came in 1992 with some, shall we say, a celebrity side <clears throat> who came for a nice little pay deal. They weren't very good. They were end of their careers. There was a lot of them on benefits. And I mean... It didn't really start until David Boone got there, and once David Boone got there, I think there was a, a little lull in the uh, you know, just after him. But after that, the club hasn't looked back. 
I can't give you time to tell the story about the first time David Boone ever saw snow <laughs> when he was in the... But we'll have to tell it another time will, because yeah. I have to get on to your fifth and final man, uh, who, the man who kept your body together. I mean, you, your journey in, in cricket um, from, from Ashington, from, from a, a, a young lad who wasn't particularly interested in cricket, to become the number one bowler in the world is truly extraordinary. And the... Um, and inspirational, by the way. Um, and the man that uh, you have p picked as number five wasn't a cricketer. He, he's called Paul Winsper, and uh, you described him as the man that either kept your body together or had to put it back together. Yeah, he, he kept it together, put it back together, uh, along with Sir Bobby Robson. I wasn't sure if I did to choose Paul. Well, it had to be Paul, but Sir Bobby had to get a mention because in 1996, when I came back from a, a disillusioned Pakistan under-19 tour, my first roommate, Alan, Alex Jeweler, um, I, I didn't want to play cricket. I had no interest. And then once I'd come back, Durham, you know, slowly but surely coaxed me back in. John Morris was key to bringing me back into... Durham play, to play cricket again and, and going into Durham and I had six months where Jeff Cook put me with Paul Winsper. It was Paul Winsper's first job in in sport. He had just left the Marines. He had been in the Marines for quite a while and he was you know, the fitness coach there and Newcastle and Durham used to train Durham used to, and Newcastle used to train behind Durham's cricket ground and within that first six months you could see how great Paul Winsper was, not only as a person, but as a, a as a fitness operator with individuals. It wasn't a collective, yeah, you've got to do this as a, a team. You've actually, your body needs this, your body needs that, your body needs this. He identified that, what your body needed to get strong. And Newcastle came call and took him away. And then it wasn't until 2003, I came back from Bangladesh. I just got man of the match in the first test match in Bangladesh. Didn't play in the second test match. There was a lot of articles written about me saying that did he want it? a bit like Ollie Robinson is now uh, what I'm questioning Ollie Robinson I was in that position and Paul Winsper showed Bobby Robson this article and Bobby Robson apparently said he can come and train here if you want so Paul got a hold of me and said look reached out do you want to come and train and for eight weeks we kept it quiet and trained with Newcastle you know the likes of Alan Shearer Gary Speed Shearer given you know experienced international players and he was like, stick with these. You eat with them, you train with them, you, you, know, you look at what they do to be international sportsmen. And for eight weeks, I did that. And that was before the West Indies trip. I went to the West Indies. And from there, my career never really looked back. I kept on going. And every time, every time I had an injury or every time there was, because there was still in six-month contracts, weren't 12-month contracts, there was no love for it at the time. So what we did was, what we did was, every time I had a chance to go back, I went back to Paul. He checked my body individually and looked after it and made sure that it was in proper work and order to go and play in the next phase of the cricket tours and the cricket time. For me, he was a huge influence along with uh, Jeff Cook. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.